In his Discourse on Continuationism, Sam Storms robustly challenges cessationist perspectives, which assert that miraculous gifts of the Spirit ceased with the apostolic era. He argues against the idea that such gifts were exclusively for authenticating the Apostles' message, suggesting instead that these gifts continue to be relevant and necessary for the Church's mission today. Storms emphasizes that the Scripture does not support the cessation of these gifts, accentuating that if miracles played a crucial role in the ministry of Jesus and the Apostles for validating the Gospel, their significance does not diminish in the Church's contemporary context. Storms debunks the reductionist stance that confines spiritual gifts to a singular function or time frame, asserting Paul's teachings in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, 10, which declare that spiritual gifts, including miraculous ones, are intended for the common good to edify and strengthen the body of Christ. This counters the cessationist claim that such gifts ceased after serving their initial purpose of apostolic authentication. Also, Storms illustrates the multifunctional nature of miraculous gifts which, beyond attestation, aid to glorify God, demonstrate His compassion, and facilitate evangelism. He cites biblical instances, such as the resurrection of Lazarus, as examples where miracles primarily aim to glorify God and reveal His compassion. Moreover, Storms utilizes Ephesians 4.11, 13 and 1 Corinthians 1.4, 9. To contend that spiritual gifts are to persist until the Church reaches unity in faith and the fullness of Christ, a goal yet to be achieved, thereby implying their continuity until Christ's return. This scriptural analysis underpins Storm's assertion that spiritual gifts, including the miraculous, have enduring pertinence for the Church's edification, the glorification of God, and the advancement of the Gospel, firmly supporting the continuationist position. Furthermore, Storms engages in the theological discourse surrounding continuationism versus cessationism, particularly focusing on the debate that the continuation of revelatory spiritual gifts, such as prophecy and speaking in tongues, might confront the doctrine of Scripture's sufficiency. This doctrine posits that the Bible comprehensively provides all necessary truths for salvation, ethical living, and godliness, rendering additional revelations unnecessary. Storms counters cessationist claims by highlighting that the very scriptures which affirm their sufficiency also instruct believers to earnestly desire and utilize spiritual gifts. He references specific passages from 1 Corinthians 12, 7, 10, 14, 1, 14, 5, 14, 39, and Acts 2, which advocate for the pursuit of spiritual gifts for the edification and encouragement of the church. These passages indicate that the gifts are intended for the common good, aiding in building up the faith community through prophecy and other spiritual manifestations. Critically examining the cessationist stance, Storms maintains the absence of explicit biblical evidence supporting the idea that revelatory gifts were meant to cease following the apostolic age. He demands the interpretation of texts like Ephesians 2, 20 and 3, 5, which cessationists often cite as implying the end of such gifts with the closure of the scriptural canon. Storms disputes these interpretations fail to directly address the continuous help found within Scripture to interconnect with spiritual gifts. By backing for the ongoing applicability and necessity of spiritual gifts, Storms points out that acknowledging their value is not only compatible with, but also a tribute to the sufficiency of Scripture. He argues that to truly uphold Scripture's authority and sufficiency, one must also embrace its guidance on the use of spiritual gifts thus integrating them into the life of the Church for edification and growth in godliness. In addition, in his critique of cessationism, Storms reiterates the New Testament's consistently positive depiction of spiritual gifts within the early Christian communities, testing the view that these gifts ceased with the apostolic age. He meticulously cites instances across various churches, Thessalonica, Antioch, Caesarea, Rome, Samaria, Ephesus, Galatia, and notably Corinth, demonstrating the widespread operation of spiritual gifts, thus contesting the contention that their presence was limited to or primarily associated with the apostles. Storms refutes the stance, as exemplified by Richard Gaffin, that the unique experiences of the early church, based by the apostles' presence, were unrepeatable in subsequent church history. Instead, Storms debates for a seamless continuity between the Church of the Acts period and the Church of later centuries. He repeats that the New Testament nowhere intimates that spiritual gifts were an exclusive endowment of the apostolic era, underlining that the universal church, 
both of then and now, shares the same spiritual foundation laid by the apostles and is empowered by the same Holy Spirit. Further, he dismantles counter-arguments supposing that miraculous gifts were closely tied to the apostles or their direct associates. By underscoring examples like Stephen, Philip and Ananias, important New Testament figures not of the apostolic cadre, Storms showcases the broader distribution of spiritual gifts. The focus on apostolic acts in Acts does not, in his view, diminish the legitimacy or significance of spiritual gifts among the wider Christian community. Storms' exposition is a compelling call for the contemporary church to accept and foster the use of spiritual gifts. By rooting his dispute in scriptural examples and encouraging for the lasting presence of these gifts, he invites a re-evaluation of cessationist perspectives and stimulates a vibrant, spirit-empowered practice of faith that aligns with the early church's example. Besides, in the discourse on spiritual gifts, potency and prevalence from the apostolic age to the present, Storms delves into the often-voiced concern that contemporary manifestations of spiritual gifts do not mirror the magnitude or efficacy witnessed in the early church. This viewpoint, critically examined by Jack Deere, argues against the expectation that modern-day spiritual gifts must align with the apostolic era's intensity to be deemed legitimate. Deere articulates that such a standard is not applied to non-miraculous gifts, like teaching or evangelism, hence it should not disqualify current expressions of miraculous gifts. He emphasizes that the apostles endowed with unique authority and miraculous powers set a precedent that does not diminish the validity of spiritual gifts in today's church. Contributing to this contention, Andrew Wilson accentuates instances from the scriptures where miracles were not instantaneous, even in Jesus's and Paul's ministries, suggesting that the absence of apostolic-level miracles in contemporary times does not signify the cessation of spiritual gifts. Instead, Wilson favors for an approach that seeks to bridge the gap between apostolic successes and current experiences. This perspective boosts learning from the early church's triumphs in various ministries to enrich and embolden today's Christian practice, rather than settling for a diminished version of Christianity. Both Storms and Wilson affirm the diversity in the distribution and operation of spiritual gifts as ordained by God, echoing the biblical affirmation that these gifts have not ceased. Their dialogue invites Christians to pursue spiritual gifts with zeal, driven by the understanding that the variance in their manifestation is a call to deeper involvement rather than a sign of their absence, emboldening a dynamic continuation of the Church's mission in the spirit of the early Apostles. Additionally, in his analysis of the cessationist cluster debate, which hypothesizes that miracles were confined to specific historical periods, Storms brings a nuanced continuationist perspective, asserting the continuous nature of miracles throughout redemptive history. Storms agrees that while miracles seem to be more frequent during certain eras, this attention does not negate the presence or possibility of miracles in other times, including the present. He proposes that the perceived scarcity of miracles in some periods may be attributed to factors like the widespread unbelief and rebellion among God's people, suggesting that the environment of faith plays a central role in the manifestation of miracles, as exemplified by Jesus' limited miraculous works in Nazareth due to unbelief. Storms tries the cessationist angle by highlighting the absence of any biblical precedent for the cessation of miracles, disputing instead for their ongoing potential. He appraises the restrictive definition of miracles favored by some cessationists, which narrowly confines miracles to acts performed through human agency for the intention of authenticating divine messengers. By examining biblical accounts, Storms demonstrates that such a definition arbitrarily excludes numerous supernatural occurrences that do not fit this narrow criterion, thereby underestimating the scope and frequency of divine activity throughout history. Also, Storms refutes the notion that miracles helped solely to authenticate divine messengers, indicating that the Bible portrays miracles as supplying a variety of divine meanings. Moreover, he cautions against arguing from silence regarding the frequency of miracles, noting that the lack of recorded miracles does not equate to their absence. By challenging the cessationist interpretation, with an extensive understanding of miraculous phenomena and their aim, Storms furthers a continuationist view that recognizes the abiding possibility and presence of miracles as part of God's ongoing interaction with the world. Furthermore, 
Storms locks deeply with the question of whether it's appropriate for Christians to pray for signs, wonders, and miraculous gifts, dissecting the issue with theological distinction and biblical references. He directly confronts a common criticism that equates the desire for the miraculous with a lack of faith. Storms counters this by pointing to the early Christian community in Acts 4, 29, 31, which openly prayed for God to manifest his power through healing, signs, and wonders in Jesus' name. This example not only legitimizes such prayers, but maintains their weight in the life of believers. In addition, Storms clarifies that the Bible distinguishes between the skepticism of the Pharisees, who demanded signs as a pretext for unbelief, and the genuine faith of believers who seek to witness God's power as a proof to his glory. The rebuke Jesus issues to the Pharisees in Matthew 12, 39 and 16. For, as Storms interprets, is targeted not at the request for miracles per se, but at the insincerity behind their demands. In stark contrast, Storms contends that when believers earnestly pray for signs and wonders, with the intention of glorifying God, such prayers are not only acceptable but essential. He postulates that the miraculous and the message of the gospel are not at odds but are complementary, each enhancing the other's gravity. For Storms, the pursuit of signs and wonders is an expression of a potent faith that actively seeks to celebrate and manifest God's sovereignty and power in the world. Storms' perspective invites Christians to reevaluate their stance on the supernatural, suggesting that a desire for God to display His power through miracles is a profound endorsement of His omnipotence and a desire for His glory to be shown on earth. This way redefines the notion of faith, positioning it not as bare acceptance, but as an active, expectant action with the divine. Further, Storm's assessment of Richard Gaffin's interpretation of the Acts of the Apostles centers on the continuity of the Holy Spirit's miraculous works, further the apostolic era. Gaffin suggests that Acts documents a definitive history, marking the apostolic spread of the gospel as a unique, non-repeatable epoch in redemptive history. He implies that the supernatural activities of the Holy Spirit, as recorded in Acts, were exclusive to this period and not intended to extend into subsequent church history. Storms confronts this view by pointing out that the New Testament, including Acts, does not support Gaffin's cessationist conclusions. Storms debates that Luke, the author of Acts, neither states nor implies that the manifestations of the Holy Spirit observed during the Apostolic Age were meant to be unique and cease thereafter. He reiterates the absence of textual evidence to substantiate the claim that charismatic gifts were limited to the Apostolic Era. Besides, Storms repeats Peter's discourse in Acts 2, which typifies the operation of miraculous gifts as characteristic of the New Covenant Age, suggesting their continuation throughout the Church Age. Contrary to Gaffin's view that the miraculous phenomena associated with the Gospel's initial expansion were epical and thus confined to the Church's founding, Storms disputes that the New Testament presents these phenomena as integral to the Church's ongoing edification and expansion. He disputes the idea that spiritual gifts had a singular, time-bound function, arguing instead for their continued importance and activity in the Church's life outside the Apostolic Age. In summary, Storm's response is a strong defense of continuationism, justifying the surviving role of the Holy Spirit's gifts in the Church. He tests cessationist interpretations by underlining the New Testament's representation of spiritual gifts as an ongoing, vital aspect of Christian life and ministry accessible to all believers for the Church's building up and the Gospel's advance. Additionally, Storms dives into the contentious debate surrounding the perfect in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and 12, offering an inclusive contention against cessationism, the belief that miraculous gifts ceased after the apostolic age, and in favor of continuationism, which holds that these gifts persist until Christ's return. At the heart of the discussion is the interpretation of the perfect, and its timing relative to the cessation or continuation of spiritual gifts like prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. Storms refutes the cessationist aspect, which sometimes identifies the perfect with the completion of the New Testament canon or a mature state of the Church before Christ's second coming. He aligns with scholars who interpret the perfect as the ultimate state of spiritual accomplishment that believers will experience at Christ's return. This eschatological perspective suggests that spiritual gifts are provisional, giving only partial knowledge of God in the present age, 
they are destined to cease only when believers attain a direct, unmediated communion with God in the eternal state, symbolized by seeing face to face and knowing fully as we are fully known by God. Storms criticizes the idea that the cessation of spiritual gifts coincided with the finalization of the biblical canon, debating that there's no evidence Paul anticipated such a canon, nor would the concept have been understandable to the Corinthians. Furthermore, he tries the notion that the maturity of the church demonstrates the end of spiritual gifts, underscoring that Paul's discussion pertains to an absolute future perfection rather than a relative present-day maturity. Basically, Storms presses for continuationism, emphasizing that Paul envisaged the uninterrupted operation of spiritual gifts until the end times. This view accentuates the enduring role of spiritual gifts in edifying the church until the consummation of God's kingdom, featured by Christ's second advent and the establishment of a new heaven and new earth. In conclusion, Storms passionately promotes continuationism, challenging the cessationist view that spiritual gifts ceased with the apostolic age. He disputes these gifts remain vital for the church's mission, affirming that the Bible does not suggest their discontinuation. Storms argues that if miracles were irresistible for validating the gospel during Jesus's and the apostles' ministries, their concern persists in today's church context. Also, Storms refutes cessationist claims by asserting that the scriptures, while affirming their own sufficiency, simultaneously hearten the pursuit of spiritual gifts for edification. He highlights that spiritual gifts, including the miraculous, were intended for the common good. To strengthen the church, a stance supported by Paul's teachings in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, 10 and further discussions on spiritual gifts throughout the New Testament. Moreover, he addresses theological concerns about the sufficiency of Scripture, countering that the Scripture's instructions to seek spiritual gifts affirm their ongoing purpose. Storms criticizes the cessationist interpretation of key biblical passages, contending for a broad grasp of spiritual gifts function beyond merely authenticating the apostolic message. Furthermore, Storms digs into the New Testament's description of spiritual gifts as widely operative across early Christian communities, not limited to the apostles. This confronts the view that gifts ceased after the apostolic era, proposing instead for their continued presence as integral to the church's life and mission. Lastly, Storm's debates extend to addressing the role of miracles throughout church history, the legitimacy of praying for miracles, and the eschatological consequence of the perfect in 1 Corinthians 13. He presupposes that spiritual gifts are to persist until the fullness of Christ's return, inspiring an active continuation of the Church's mission in the power of the Holy Spirit. This complete stance not only criticizes cessationism, but also invites an active, faith-filled practice of Christianity, acutely implanted in scriptural guidance and the example of the early Church. On the other hand, in the energetic landscape of Christian theology, the debate over spiritual gifts, specifically their continuation or cessation, remains a pivotal point of discussion among believers. This discourse, broadened by contributions from theologians across the spectrum, embodies the Church's quest for truth and fidelity to the Scriptures. Storms, a prominent push for continuationism, presents fascinating disputes for the ongoing operation of spiritual gifts, including those of a miraculous nature, within the Church today. Storm's position tests the cessationist perspective, which holds that certain gifts ceased with the apostolic era, proposing instead that these gifts persist as important tools for the Church's mission and the edification of believers. In response, it is imperative to enunciate a well-reasoned cessationist attitude, granting a counter-narrative that is both respectful and intensely entrenched in a holistic insight of Scripture and historical Church practice. This response aims not only to connect with the arguments presented by storms, but also to indicate the cessationist belief in the sufficiency of Scripture, the distinct roles of spiritual gifts in redemptive history, and the specific functions that ceased with the close of the apostolic age. By examining the biblical, theological, and historical facets of this debate, the goal is to contribute an encyclopedic and scripturally grounded explanation for the cessation of apostolic era gifts while affirming the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Church. Through this respectful dialogue, 
We endeavor to contribute to the expansive theological conversation, promoting unity and mutual knowledge among Christians, regardless of where they stand on this issue. The cessationist response is thus framed not as a divisive polemic, but as a sincere attempt to navigate the abundant drapery of Christian doctrine, with a firm commitment to upholding the authority and sufficiency of Scripture as the ultimate guide for faith and practice. First of all, in the realm of Christian theology, the ambition and duration of miraculous gifts have been subjects of considerable debate, especially between continuationists and cessationists. This discourse is not slightly academic. It passionately impacts how believers discern the work of the Holy Spirit, the nature of God's revelation, and the application of Scripture in the life of the Church. The cessationist perspective, which posits that certain miraculous gifts ceased with the apostolic era, provides a subtle interpretation of Scripture and Church history to support its claims. The cessationist contention is anchored in a historical redemptive foundation. Recognizing that miraculous gifts were especially manifest during specific epochs in redemptive history, namely the Mosaic, the Prophetic, Elijah and Elisha, and the Apostolic, Jesus and the Apostles periods. These were times of crucial redemptive acts by God and the introduction of new revelation. Miraculous gifts delivered as God's authentication of His messengers and their message during these central moments. This pattern maintains the belief that such gifts are not normative for all eras of church history, but were instead sovereignly bestowed by God to fulfill notable aspirations in his redemptive plan. A key scriptural passage often cited in this discussion is Ephesians 2.20, where apostles and prophets are described as the base of the church. The cessationist debate holds that once the bedrock is laid, signified by the finishing of the New Testament canon, the extraordinary gifts that authenticated the apostles' ministry and message were no longer necessary. This interpretation is bolstered by the noticeable decline in miraculous activities even before the close of the New Testament canon suggesting a divinely intended cessation, rather than an arbitrary halt. In addition, historical scrutinies equip support for cessationism. After the Apostolic Age, the early Church Fathers, the Reformers, and other key figures throughout Church history have remarked on the absence, or big reduction, of miraculous gifts. These conclusions are not presented to limit God's sovereignty or His capacity to perform miracles, but to recognize a pattern where the normative function of certain gifts was tied to the Church's fundamental period. Further, the cessationist direction points out the sufficiency of Scripture, disputing that the achieved canon of Scripture furnishes all that is necessary for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16, 17 In this view, the ongoing need for apostolic-level miraculous gifts diminishes, given the self-authenticating nature of Scripture and its ability to equip believers fully for every good work. Besides, it's decisive to distinguish between the occurrence of miracles and the possession of miraculous gifts. Cessationists support that God continues to perform miracles according to His will, but differentiate these sovereign acts from the New Testament gifts of healing, prophecy and tongues, which were specific sign gifts given to authenticate the apostolic message. This distinction is deciding in figuring out the cessationist stance which affirms God's ongoing activity in the world while maintaining a specific perception of the direction and duration of miraculous gifts. In essence, the cessationist perspective on the function and duration of miraculous gifts is profoundly fixed in a theological, historical and exegetical framework that seeks to faithfully interpret Scripture and follow the continuity of God's redemptive work. It respects the unique role of the apostolic era in the history of redemption, the sufficiency of Scripture for guiding the Church, and the distinct ways God continues to work in His creation and among His people. Additionally, the scriptural evidence for cessationism, the theological stance that certain spiritual gifts ceased after the apostolic era, is a subject of deep scrutiny and discussion within Christian theology. Although there is no single verse explicitly stating the cessation of these gifts, the doctrinal position is derived from an exhaustive analysis of biblical texts, analogous to other core doctrines such as the Trinity. Cessationists point to several scriptural indications suggesting that gifts like tongues, prophecy and healing, often categorized as sign gifts, were not intended to continue indefinitely. The argument for cessationism is anchored in the unique role these gifts played in the apostolic era. Miraculous gifts gave to authenticate the apostles' ministry and the nascent church's message in a time before the New Testament canon was concluded.
Acts 2.43 and 5.12, for instance, reiterate that miracles were predominantly performed by the apostles, repeating the gift's role in validating the apostolic message and witness. This apostolic groundwork of the church, once enacted, no longer necessitated the continuation of these sign gifts. Further supporting the cessationist view is the consideration that miraculous gifts, even within the New Testament account, appear to diminish in frequency towards the end of the apostolic era. This pattern suggests a divinely intended cessation rather than an abrupt end. Also, the finalization of the New Testament canon, which cessationists contend, gives all necessary revelation for faith and godliness, means a consequential shift in how God communicates with his people. The sufficiency of scripture implies that the revelatory gifts that once guided the early church are no longer necessary. Moreover, cessationists note the absence of a consistent widespread operation of miraculous gifts, further the apostolic age, aligning with historical examinations and the testimonies of early church fathers. While acknowledging that God continues to work miracles according to his will, cessationists distinguish between occasional divine acts and the normative operation of apostolic era gifts within the church. The cessationist debate extends to the nature and function of spiritual gifts in the post-apostolic church. Paul's epistles, while discussing spiritual gifts, also underline order, edification, and the primacy of love over the exercise of gifts. This focus suggests that the ultimate goal of spiritual gifts is to build up the church in love and maturity, an intent that continues without the need for ongoing miraculous signs. In summation, the scriptural evidence for cessationism is not based on a single proof text, but on a complete interpretation of scripture's teaching about the objective, function, and historical context of spiritual gifts. By examining the pattern of redemptive history, the unique role of the apostolic era, and the sufficiency of scripture, cessationists dispute for a theological realization that sees the cessation of certain gifts as consistent with God's sovereign plan for his church. Furthermore, the historical and theological context surrounding the cessationist perspective is seriously embedded in the church's interpretive tradition and its doctrinal evolution. At the center of this perspective is the recognition that certain spiritual gifts, principally those manifesting as miraculous signs, presented a specific plan during the central era of the church. This view is not born out of a vacuum, but is informed by an elegant dosser of historical theology, a discipline that examines how the church has grasped and expressed its beliefs across the centuries. Historical theology supplies intuitiveness into how the early church fathers, the reformers, and subsequent generations of theologians have wrestled with the nature and function of spiritual gifts. This discipline uncovers a delicate description that suggests a gradual cessation of the apostolic gifts as the canon of Scripture was accomplished and the constitutional era of the Church concluded. The Reformers, especially within the Reformed tradition, underscored the sufficiency of Scripture for faith and life, arguing that the miraculous gifts of the apostolic era were given for the principle of authenticating the Apostles' ministry and the nascent Church's message. The Westminster Confession of Faith an essential document of Reformed theology while not explicitly addressing the cessation of spiritual gifts, emphasizes the principle of sola scriptura, the scripture alone as the authority for the church. This principle implicitly supports the cessationist view by accentuating the completed revelation in scripture as the infrastructure for the church's teaching and practice, thereby diminishing the need for ongoing apostolic gifts for revelation and authentication. In addition, the historical context of the Church's development post-apostolic era provides additional support for the cessationist stance. The early Church fathers and subsequent Christian leaders saw a decline in the manifestation of miraculous gifts, a trend that aligned with their sense of the transition from the apostolic era to a period where the written Word of God would hold primacy in guiding the Church's faith and practice. This experience is not to deny the sovereignty of God in performing miracles, but to distinguish between the normative operation of miraculous gifts in the apostolic era and the extraordinary instances of divine intervention throughout church history. Further, the cessationist perspective is advanced by the theological awareness of notable figures such as Augustine, who, despite witnessing miraculous healings, did not equate these with the apostolic gifts meant to authenticate the initial spread of the gospel. Augustine's fine view affirms the distinction between God's sovereign acts of miracles 
and the specific, purpose-driven gifts of the apostolic era. In brief, the historical and theological context of cessationism is anchored in a careful examination of the Church's doctrinal growth, the interpretive tradition of the early Church fathers and reformers, and the noticed decline in the operation of miraculous gifts post-apostolic era. This context asserts the belief in the sufficiency of Scripture and the accomplishment of divine revelation with the canon, principles that have shaped the cessationist outlook throughout Church history. The cessationist perspective, therefore, emerges from a deep contact with the Church's historical and theological heritage, affirming a continuity of doctrine that respects the unique role of the apostolic era while upholding the abiding authority of Scripture for the Church's life and witness. Besides, in the post-apostolic age, grasping the role of the Holy Spirit involves both continuity and advancement in the Church's theology and practice. Initially, the early Church experienced the Holy Spirit's work vividly and vitally, distinguished by the direct impartation of spiritual gifts, including miraculous ones, as a testimonial to the new covenant formed through Christ. This period was defined by a deep awareness of the Spirit's presence, guiding, empowering, and directly interacting with believers, as evidenced in the practices and experiences of the apostolic and early post-apostolic church. However, as the church moved outside the apostolic age, its relationship with the Holy Spirit began to evolve. The crucial role of the apostles, as delineated in Ephesians 2.20, highlights a specific period in the church's evolution, wherein the apostles' teachings and the miraculous gifts provided to authenticate the nascent Christian faith amidst a predominantly non-Christian world. The cessation of apostolic gifts did not signify the diminution of the Holy Spirit's activity, but rather indicated a transition to a different mode of operation within the life of the Church. The Church Fathers, from Ignatius to Tertullian, affirm this transitional awareness, recognizing the unique support laid by the Apostles and the subsequent shift towards a more structured and sacramental expression of the faith. Additionally, this transition is elucidated in the Church's historical and theological commitment with the Holy Spirit's work. The Spirit's role, while initially associated with direct revelation and miraculous gifts, increasingly focused on sanctification, illumination of Scripture, and the inward transformation of believers. This shift is reflected in the Church's sacramental theology and its consequence on the Holy Spirit's ongoing work in regeneration, sanctification, and the assurance of salvation. Theologians and church leaders across various epochs have uttered an exact understanding of the Spirit's work, balancing the charismatic and institutional dimensions of the church's life. Also, the Reformation brought considerable attention to the Holy Spirit's role in relation to Scripture and the believer's conscience. Reformers like Martin Luther underlined the Spirit's work through the Word, underscoring that Scripture is the primary means through which the Spirit speaks to and guides the believer. This perspective reinforced the principle of sola scriptura and emphasized the Spirit's ongoing ministry in teaching, convicting, and comforting the faithful. Apart from the extraordinary gifts characteristic of the apostolic era, all in all, the role of the Holy Spirit in the post-apostolic age is described by a fertile arras of theological thought and ecclesial practice that accentuates the Spirit's continued presence and activity within the Church. While the miraculous gifts associated with the apostolic age handled an elemental role, the Spirit's work in guiding, sanctifying and empowering the Church has remained central to the Christian faith. This surviving presence chews a compelling ascertainment of the Holy Spirit's work, affirming both the continuity of God's engagement with His people and the adaptability of the Church's theology and practice in response to the Spirit's leading throughout history. Moreover, responding to the contention for continuation based on a desire for miracles requires a minute grasp of both the biblical and theological supports of Christian faith, as well as a compassionate recognition of the human longing for the divine. The desire for miracles, especially within the context of continuationist debates, is often rooted in a genuine pursuit of experiencing God's power and presence in tangible ways. This desire can be seen as a thinking of the deep spiritual hunger that identifies the human condition, a yearning for something beyond the ordinary that points to the transcendent and the miraculous. However, from a cessationist perspective, this longing must be carefully determined and guided by sound theological principles.
the cessationist dispute, does not deny God's ability to perform miracles today, or his sovereign freedom to intervene in human affairs in extraordinary ways. Rather, cessationism supposes that the specific spiritual gifts of apostolic healing, prophecy and tongues, as they were practiced in the New Testament era, served an uncommon reason during the essential period of the Church's history. These gifts were decisive for authenticating the Apostles' ministry and the nascent Christian message in a context where the New Testament canon had not yet been formed. In addressing the continuationist desire for miracles, cessationists affirm the sufficiency of Scripture as the disclosed Word of God, which brings all necessary guidance for faith and practice. The finished canon of Scripture, cessationists argue, renders the need for ongoing apostolic gifts unnecessary for the life of the Church. This perspective does not diminish the work of the Holy Spirit, but recognizes that His ministry continues through the illumination of Scripture, convicting believers of sin, guiding them into all truth, and empowering them for service. Furthermore, cessationists caution against equating the frequency and public display of miraculous gifts with the measure of God's presence or favor. The New Testament itself shifts the focus from the miraculous to the fruit of the Spirit asserting love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control as the enduring demonstration of a spirit-filled life. These virtues, which cogitate the character of Christ, are to be pursued and cultivated by believers, pointing to a mature acumen of spiritual growth that goes further the spectacular. In addition, cessationists highlight the potential dangers of an uncritical desire for miracles such as the risk of being led astray by false teachings or the possibility of placing experience above the authority of Scripture. By appealing to biblical perception and a Christ-centered faith, cessationists recommend for a balanced spirituality that honors God's sovereignty while remaining anchored in the truth of His Word. In a word, the cessationist response to the contention for continuation based on a desire for miracles is grounded in an involvement to the authority of Scripture the sufficiency of God's revelation in Christ, and a refined knowledge of the Holy Spirit's role in the believer's life. It reassures believers to seek a deeper relationship with God through His Word, to cherish the ordinary means of grace, and to live out the life-changing power of the gospel in everyday life. Last but not least, the debate surrounding the perfect in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, 12 forms and vital intersection in the discussion between cessationists and continuationists. This passage, often interpreted in various ways, is at the core of Paul's discourse on love and spiritual gifts. Cessationists, who debate that certain miraculous gifts have ceased, apply with this text to support their position, indicating the achievement or maturity it refers to as a marker for the cessation of certain gifts. Cessationists dispute that interpreting the perfect requires contextual and theological considerations that align with the far-reaching witness of Scripture and the historical unfolding of God's redemptive plan. While interpretations vary among scholars, a common cessationist perspective is that the perfect indicates a state of conclusion or maturity that was anticipated in the Church's expansion or in the canon of Scripture. Some cessationist scholars, like B.B. Warfield, argue that the finalized canon of Scripture represents the perfect, signifying that once the full revelation of God was given in the Scriptures, the need for certain revelatory gifts ceased. This view correlates the maturing of the Church with the closing of the New Testament canon, a time when the indispensable gifts, such as apostleship and prophecy, aided their target in authenticating the message and messengers of the New Covenant. Besides, cessationists contend that the nature of spiritual gifts, as described in the New Testament, exceptionally their role in inaugurating and confirming the early Church, points to their temporary function. The apostolic era was unique in redemptive history, indicated by direct revelation and the integral laying of the Church. As Ephesians 2.20 indicates, the Church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Once this base was laid, the extraordinary means used to install it, namely certain miraculous gifts, were no longer necessary. Additionally, cessationists maintain the ultimate goal of all spiritual gifts, the edification of the Church and the glorification of Christ. The lasting gifts, such as teaching and administration, continue to build up the body of Christ in love, unity and knowledge of the truth.
In this view, the cessation of certain gifts does not diminish the Holy Spirit's work, but points out the transition to a phase in the Church's life where the written word and the indwelling Spirit guide and grow God's people. The cessationist interpretation of the perfect in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 12, is thus part of a sweeping theological debate that considers the nature of spiritual gifts, the unique role of the apostolic era, and the sufficiency of Scripture. It suggests that while God remains sovereign and capable of performing miracles, the specific gifts in question helped a temporary, intrinsic determination, culminating in a matured revelation and a fully instituted church. This perspective reiterates an assurance to the authority of Scripture, the finality of apostolic revelation, and the ongoing ministry of the Spirit through the means He has chosen for His Church's edification and mission in the post-apostolic age. In conclusion, the cessationist perspective on spiritual gifts, particularly those of a miraculous nature, represents a surely implanted theological stance grounded in an extensive interpretation of Scripture, the historical context of the early Church, and the sufficiency of God's revelation through the completed canon of Scripture. This perspective does not diminish the Holy Spirit's ongoing work within the Church or deny God's sovereign capability to perform miracles today. Instead, it recognizes the unique role of certain gifts during the apostolic era, a time indicated by the major laying of the Church's doctrine and the authentication of the Apostles' message. As the Church transitioned outside limits in this era, the primary means by which the Holy Spirit works among God's people shifted to the sanctification of the believer the illumination of Scripture, and the empowerment for service and witness through gifts that edify the body of Christ in love and unity. Cessationism, therefore, is not a denial of the Spirit's power or presence, but an affirmation of the all-sufficiency of Christ's work and the completed revelation of God as found in Scripture. It spurs believers to seek a deeper relationship with God through His Word, to cherish the ordinary means of grace contributed for growth in godliness and to dovetail in the mission of the Church with the assurance that the same Spirit who empowered the Apostles continues to work in and through His people today. Lastly, this perspective beckons the Church to a mature perception of spiritual gifts, one that is entrenched in the authority of Scripture, the historical progress of Christian doctrine, and an obligation to the edification of the Church in love. It invites a booming action with the biblical text, a respectful dialogue within the wide Christian community and a shared dedication to the gospel mission that goes beyond differences over spiritual gifts. In accepting both the continuity of the Holy Spirit's work and the particularities of God's redemptive actions in history, the cessationist view contributes to a full and meticulous theology of the Spirit that enlightens the Church's realization and practice of its faith in a complex and changing world.